Now, the UN's political chief has said the Taliban cannot be a part of the international community until they do more for women and girls in Afghanistan. Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo delivered that message following a UN-led meeting on Afghanistan held in the Qatari capital, Doha. Taliban leaders were invited to attend for the first time since their return to power in 2021. The government they formed has cracked down on women's freedoms, leading to a situation that human rights groups have described as gender apartheid. There was a day in the spring of 2022 when older Afghan girls and young women felt the rush of the first day of classes, greeting their friends, laughing, and thinking about the future. The ban on girls in secondary and higher education had been lifted, and some girls actually made it into classrooms where teachers actually taught them. A couple of hours of learning for some, a couple of minutes for others. It ended in a dream-crushing blow when Taliban leaders changed their minds. But I don't know why Taliban uh, uh, don't want uh, girls to um, go to a university, go to a school. I don't know, but i uh, thinking about that uh, always. Small but vocal protests followed, women risking arrest. But the Taliban said higher education for boys was okay, not for girls. Any action that is taken, whether it's economic, social, cultural, educational or military, will be under the influence of Sharia laws. International pressure on the Taliban to alter its stance has fallen on deaf ears. If you are a girl in Afghanistan, the Taliban has decided your future for you. And that future, the UN rapporteur and UN officials say, is bleak. The ban on girls' education is fueling an increase in child marriage and early childbearing, with dire physical, emotional, and economic consequences. Reports of attempted suicides among women and girls are also increasing. A UN-funded report says oppression now goes far, far beyond the education ban and possibly amounts to crimes against humanity. But it cites the ingenuity of Afghan women and girls, like those girls at this secret school, risking captivity or worse for the sake of a dream and life after the Taliban. Pashtana Durrani is founder and executive director of Learn Afghan. That's a non-profit organization promoting education, maternal health care and female empowerment in Afghanistan. I asked her what she thought when she heard that the UN had agreed to meet the Taliban to discuss the status of women in the country, amongst other things, without any women in the room. Honestly, the whole world is talking about Afghan women without Afghan women being present in those meetings. Um, it's disappointing and it's disgraceful on many levels, but that's what um, the U.S. did first and now the U.N. is following their pathway, yeah. And is it better to talk to the Taliban about women without women present than to not talk at all? Let me ask you this question. What are they talking to the Taliban about women? Are the Taliban Afghan women? Certainly not, right? Also, the second question is, what have they done in the past three years for Afghan women that makes them advocates to talk on Afghan women rights? nothing, right? What are their solutions, frameworks that they have worked on for the past three years that has made it possible, or even in the past three decades that have made it possible for us to think that they could do something when it comes to women's rights? How come talking to them is going to give us any results? You can go to Ministry of Education, you can go to Ministry of Economy, there's no framework, there is no future plan, there, the healthcare is right now in paralysis, um, but the world thinks that the Taliban have answers to the problems of Afghanistan, especially when it comes to the abuses of women rights. So you think there is no point talking to them at all? You have to walk the talk. How are you talking to them if they don't have anything to present for? What have they done that makes them, you know, useful to talk about all of this? That's the let most me, important okay. thing. So well, let, let, me, let me see if I can put the counter argument to, uh, to you, which would be that the Taliban is in charge. They are running things and you don't... We, we've tried 
isolating them. That hasn't worked, or it certainly isn't working, so maybe talking to them might bring about some sort of change. Are they? Are they in charge? That's the question. Because right now the country also is running secret schools. You just showed one. I run five. There are schools that are being run in hospitals. There are schools that are being run in guest houses. So are they in charge? Because if they were in charge, their ban would go in those spaces, right? And there are still women who work in hiding. So I don't think they are in charge. It's a sham. Yes, sure, there is a power struggle that is happening. Sure, they are physically holding the capital and the spaces. But it doesn't mean that they are holding um, the rights of Afghan women. And also, it's, it doesn't make it right to talk to them. So um, the Taliban could be present in those talks, but it shouldn't be where in the absence of Afghan women, in the absence of Afghan civil society at all. Tell us more uh, then uh, about that part of your, uh, of your mission, of Learn Afghan's mission, which is to empower women. How do you empower women uh, in a country that deliberately seeks to disempower them? Well, first of all, Afghanistan has a long history of empowering Afghan women. We have been long known for ensuring that women stayed in leadership and politics. We have a 3,000-year-old history of women staying in power, starting from Gawahar Shad Begum up until Suraya. Um, so I'm pretty sure that we have a history there. But apart from that, I do think that right now, I don't want to claim that I am empowering women. Um, we just do our part. We ensure that schools stay open. We ensure that girls are able to access education, that women are able to teach, and women are able to get some sort of employment um, in today's disappointing situation. And I think that's some part in playing, empowering them, yeah. You've, you, you've been quite scathing uh, about uh, certainly the, the West's uh, efforts in this regard. I, I wonder, do you think that the West has to bear its share of the blame for the country's terrible situation, having excluded uh, the government, the Taliban government, uh, from the world and frozen billions of dollars in Afghan assets in US banks? See, I'm going to be honest. I'm not naive here to say that Right now, the country is in shambles because of one group. Um, many were involved in that. The, of course, the Western countries were involved because they never took either the Afghan population seriously. And when there were uh, discussions and they were talking to the Taliban, they even didn't even care about the Afghan population back then. Um, they did their uh, contracts and left. And then comes the Taliban, who have been burning schools, throwing assets, and have always been against education. Certainly, you cannot expect them to change all over night because their foot soldiers definitely don't expect that. And then there was the corrupt government in the past three decades who never thought that apart from taking money and stealing money, they, they could build the country right. and at least leave it in their space. So um, all of them are to be blamed. So lots um, of blame to go around. Okay. All right. Thank you so much yeah. for outlining that so clearly for us. Thank you uh, for your time. Pashtana Durrani uh, from Learn Afghan. Thank you. Mariam Safi is the executive director of the Organization for Policy Research and Development Studies. That's a women-led independent NGO that works to strengthen inclusivity and plural pluralism in Afghanistan. She joins me now from London. Welcome to DW, Ms. Safi. So your organization tries to strengthen inclusivity and pluralism in Afghanistan. What do you do to try and make that happen, especially now with the Taliban in power? Well, we try to make sure that we continue our various training programs for Afghan women across the country. We also conduct surveys regularly with thousands of Afghan women across the country. And we channel those voices to policymakers in key capitals, the UN, the European Union. And we try to ensure that they hear those voices and they incorporate those voices in their decision-making processes. So we try to ensure that we include Afghan women in all processes of decision making. Despite the, the really severe restrictions imposed uh, on women and girls by the Taliban, can you give us some examples of how um, Afghan women are defying those restrictions? We saw in our report there secret classrooms and lessons, and, and you mentioned just now training programs. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Well, there are several civil society organizations that have continued their operations inside of the country, uh, some of them uh, in the dark. Um, while others perhaps registered with the de facto authorities. But in those programs that are offered, you have uh, online education programs, uh, you've got training programs that are taking place uh, predominantly online, um, but you also have uh, young women getting together and opening up uh, book clubs um, or other types of spaces where they can engage with one another in private um, and give themselves an outlet to be able to express how they're feeling. Also, conversations that they have on social media, expressing themselves on social media has also been a very helpful platform. Um, so there are pockets of resistance, um, but that, those pockets are quite small. Beyond these pockets, there is no other space for Afghan women to be able to express themselves. And that obviously has consequences. Could you talk to us a little bit about both the social and the economic consequences of excluding women from society in this way? If you don't have women's perspectives, uh, their solutions on, on, on whether it's economic issues or counter-narcotics or security, uh, then those solutions uh, are unsustainable. Uh, not having women uh, at the table, not having women engage in, th in these discussions uh, means sidelining half of the population of a country. And so you have to hear from those that are being affected directly by these issues in order to be pro in order to propose uh, sustainable uh, solutions. And that simply does not take place if you don't have women at the table and are not engaging directly with Afghan women. And when you don't, that can be incredibly dangerous uh, and harmful. What about the, the psychological effect on women themselves? I mean, you were talking just now about the effects on society. What about the individuals? I mean, how are women being affected by the fact that they cannot, in many ways, um, participate in society? Well, our research has found that a lot of, um, a lot of young women in Afghanistan are right now suffering from, uh, from severe depression and severe anxiety. Uh, the suicide rate among Afghan women is also steadily increasing. Uh, they are finding no way out of this darkness. And a survey that we conducted not too long ago um, showed us that a large majority of women um, either themselves are going through depression and anxiety and suffering from this, but also know someone else who is. And this is something we have steadily seen uh, increase and mention in several other reports. So the, the scenario for Afghan women is as such that they are uh, feeling quite desperate uh, now mm -hmm. and, um, and, and as it would be, being confined to your home. Mm -hmm. Safi, we've got 20 seconds left. Do you remain hopeful that the Taliban will someday loosen some of the restrictions that they've imposed? Absolutely not. So far, they haven't been held accountable for any of the edicts that they have announced uh, restricting women and girls. So if there is no accountability measures there, the international community is not pressure, putting pressure on them to, 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 to remove these sanctions, mm -hmm. then no, we will not see the Taliban change their stance. Mariam Safi, Executive Director from the Organization of Policy Research and Development Studies in Afghanistan. Thank you so much for your time. For more on this, I'm joined now by Nazanin Wali from DW Dari and Pashtu Service in Bonn. So the UN representatives have told the Taliban at that conference in Doha that women must be included in public life. Do you expect this to have any impact? Thank you for having me. Um, actually, yesterday they said that, uh, Rosemary de Carlo said that it is the beginning of a process. And also the um, uh, spokesperson for Taliban and head of the delegation of Taliban, Zabiullah Mujahid, he claimed that they need time for it. So um, see, uh, taking all that into consideration, it looks like it's going to be a long process. And the effects, of course, it would have an effect on Afghan uh, people and women in Afghanistan um, and Afghanistan in general. But in what uh, period of time and how would it affect is a question right now. Um, most of the people which we talk to um, 
are not very optimistic in terms of the effects and positive effect, uh, effects on human rights and um, rights of women in Afghanistan. Uh, but let's see how it would uh, proceed, actually. Now, UN representatives and international delegations, I understand, will meet with Afghan women's rights groups today in Doha. What can we expect? Actually, today, uh, the meeting with the uh, civil society and representatives of women um, has started, but unfortunately, the media um, did not have the allowance and permission to take part in this meeting or have anything as an information yet. Uh, we do know that some women, like uh, Habiba Sarabi, who was the um, deputy of the um, High Peace Committee, in, former deputy, um, also um, other women like Zubaida Akbar, which was one of the uh, women rights activists and also uh, Deputy Minister of Women's Ministry, um, uh, Mrs. Musley. They all rejected the invitation of UN for joining this uh, meeting. But as we have heard from Doha, from our colleagues, um, some people have come from Afghanistan and also some other women activists and civil society members might join online, but we are not sure who they are yet. And uh, this is very um, secret now. So Actually, we don't know who they are who are going to decide on the situation of Afghanistan right now. But as uh, Rosemary De Carlo said yesterday, they are going to have a meeting today about it with the civil society and some representatives of women. Now, improving women's rights and providing girls with access to education, those are among the key demands we've heard from Western leaders since the Taliban returned to power. What has that Islamist group been saying about these demands? Um, as we heard uh, before the meeting of Doha from the uh, head of the Taliban delegation, Zabiullah Mujahid, he said that these are the internal affairs of Afghanistan. And yesterday he um, actually repeated again that these topics are um, internal affairs of Afghanistan. They acknowledge the problems, their problems and also the demands of the people, but they need time for it. And, um, I read several um, Afghan women writing that how much more time do we need to give because okay. it's already more than a thousand days that Afghan women um, do not have like um, higher than the sixth grade do not have the access to education. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Nazanin Wali from DW Diary and Pasture Service. Thank you very much.